All right, hi everyone. Welcome to our webinar today on induction cooking, your questions answered. I'm Joe Wachunas uh, with Electrify Now here as always with Brian Stewart, my teammate. We are so excited to have this all-star cast of induction cooking experts here today who we'll introduce in just a second. But uh, is this, if this is your first Electrify Now webinar, uh, we uh, like to talk to you about our message and we boil that message into four easy steps. Uh, we believe that electrification is the uh, quickest and easiest uh, way to decarbonize. And so uh, the first step to doing that is getting clean electricity for your home through rooftop solar or community solar or your utilities green uh, power program. The second one is to electrify your home. And today we're gonna be talking about a big portion of electrification, electrifying your uh, cooking equipment. Uh, uh, number three is electrifying your rides. Uh, we'll talk more about an upcoming webinar on electric bikes, but we have lots of um, webinars and materials on our website and on our YouTube uh, channel on how to electrify your transportation. And then number four is electrifying everyone, making sure the benefits of electrification reach uh, those who need them most. And while we're talking about that, we want to thank uh, everyone who donated in signing up for this webinar to uh, the nonprofit that we're partnering with for this year, Seeds uh, for the Soul. Uh, Seeds for the Soul is a nonprofit that collects donations and helps uh, fund rooftop solar and other electrification uh, installations in homes uh, here in Oregon. Um, and so we are excited to partner with them and we raised over $200 just for this webinar alone. So thanks so much. A huge shout out to our Electrify Coalition. This is over 50 organizations, uh, including Kitchens to Life that Rochelle uh, represents, um, uh, that believe that in electrification and support electrification, for-profit, nonprofit trades. If you'd like to join, uh, reach out to Brian or I. You can find our information on our website, electrifynow.net. And then a big plug to our upcoming webinar on July 12th, we're gonna talk about dual fuel heating systems. Um, uh, we're going to explore whether they, uh, what place they have in the transition to electrification. This is when you have a gas backup to your um, uh, electric uh, heating. And uh, we do want to shout out also to our Electrify webinars recordings. Just go to our YouTube channel. You can see there on the page um, we have uh, resources for every type of electrification project you uh, are interested in. And we just passed a thousand subscribers on YouTube, so uh, make sure to subscribe <laughs> to our YouTube channel. Okay, Brian, talk to us about induction stoves. Uh, why are we talking about this subject? Today? Okay, well, and why is there a picture of a gas stove on an induction stove webinar? Well, well, I think it's pretty been, been pretty much impossible to ignore the, uh, the news uh, or avoid the news about gas stoves and the harms of gas stoves. And it turns out this is something we've known for uh, almost 40 years, um, but there's been a resurgence in information about this as some new studies have come online. And, and I think it's noteworthy that the American Medical Association just came out with some statements recently to um, saying that the use of gas stoves in households creates air pollution and increases the risk of childhood asthma and asthma severity. And um, they said that children living in homes that cook with gas are 42% more likely to experience symptoms associated with asthma. So that's pretty, um, pretty scary. And then we've also been learning that peak indoor air pollution from gas stoves can reach levels that would be illegal outdoors and this can happen in minutes, even if you've got ventilation. And we've also been learning that gas stoves leak methane and benzene and other harmful chemicals that are mixed in with the methane. And this happens even when they're not in use. So there's basically a lot of reasons to be concerned about having a gas stove in your home. And that has been one of the things that's been driving the um, new interest in induction um, as an alternative to this, but a lot of times, you know, the alternatives aren't good. In this case, the alternative is better, which is what we're going to be talking about. And you've probably also been seeing some of the news from pretty much every major publication. I just picked a couple here. Consumer Reports has been talking about how good induction cooktops tops are. And interestingly, they did a survey of over 2,000 people and uh, found this result that almost 70% of them said that they're considering induction for their next range or cooktop. And then Forbes is talking about induction overtaking or poised to overtake gas stoves uh, in the coming years. Although we, we have to point out they're a very small portion of the market share currently, but I think the growth is spectacular. And, and they attribute this partly to the fact that it's got this kind of perfect combination of safety, performance and ease of use, which makes it really fit in nicely with people's kind of expectations. Um, for their lifestyles today. So 
It's easy to be excited about induction. We're going to be talking about all that today. I do want to point this one piece of information out because all with all this news, of course, there's always a backlash and there's people talking about, you won't take my gas stove away from me. And it makes you think that maybe there's a lot of gas stoves out there and there are, but it's not what you might think if you've been just hearing that kind of weird news. It's about 38% nationally, although in some places it's much higher than that. California, where both Richard and Rochelle, two of our panelists today are, are based, um, they have a very high percentage of gas stoves there. Same in New Jersey, Illinois, and other places on the East Coast. So it's very, it varies from um, state to state, but in general, it's less than half of the stoves out there are, are uh, gas. But in, if any of you out there on our show or have an electric range, you may still be interested in this because there's a lot of reasons to be excited about induction, regardless of what you have for your current um, cooktop or range. So this is what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about how induction performs compared to gas and electric. Just get the facts out there because we've got some great um, studies on that that we'll be talking about. We're going to be talking about tips for how you use an induction stove to get the most out of it. And we've got an expert on that. Um, we're going to talk about cookware. You have to touch on that. And induction hot plates, amazing little device that everyone should know about and why they're such a good idea. Uh, we've got some... Uh, a, the appliance expert here is going to talk about brands and models that are currently available and the sort of features you might want to be thinking about and, of course, how much these things cost. And then, importantly, we're going to talk about what is involved in installing an induction cooktop or range. And, of course, it's going to depend on what you've got right now, but we'll we'll touch on, on that just so people can be prepared for that um, if you're serious about going induction. And... I'm going to introduce our three panelists here, and we're going to start with Richard Young. He's the Director of Outreach at Frontier Energy Food Service Technology Center, and they provide programs, services, and tools that encourage the intelligent use of energy. Richard was part of the team which completed some of the most thorough research available on the performance of induction cooking compared to electric resistance and gas cooktops. We'll be hearing about that today. And he focuses on translating Frontier's Energy's amazing 34 years of food service research into practical information that all of us regular people can use. Uh, and we'll be, you'll be getting a dose of that today. And then we have uh, one of our, our favorite panelists who's been on many of our shows before, uh, Chef Rochelle Boucher. She's the senior lead for culinary events at the Building Decarbonization Coalition, an amazing uh, uh, organization in California, the BDC we refer to at. Chef Rochelle is a celebrated national cooking appliance expert, private chef and influencer. Little known fact, she was the private chef for George Lucas and also for the rock band Metallica. For all you headbangers out there, um, that's a pretty cool claim to fame. Uh, at BDC, she uses her 20 years of experience creating custom training programs and workshops for appliance brands, architects, designers, developers, and end users to help everyone choose, use, and enjoy modern electric cooking appliances to help decarbonize buildings. She's been called the, the appliance whisperer for a good reason, and you'll see why when you meet her in a minute. And then we have Steve Scheinkoff, who's CEO of Yale Appliance. Steve runs one of the nation's oldest family-owned um, and most sophisticated appliance dealers in the country, located on the East Coast in the Massachusetts area. Yale Appliances has developed a wealth of experience with induction products and offer fantastic online resources for consumers. We um, definitely point people there on our website because it's such a great source of information. They're dedicated to customer service and have experience with all the major appliance brands, including the latest new appliance releases, which makes him kind of a perfect uh, panelist for us to talk about what's available out there and the practicalities of shopping for and installing uh, an induction range. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Richard and um, maybe just take this moment to remind everyone that if you've got questions, um, please put them in the chat or actually the Q&A and we'll do our best to answer them along the way or make sure they get answered uh, in the end. Hello, everybody, and uh, uh, greetings from sunny San Ramon, California. Uh, I'm going to kick it off with a brief technical description of induction. 
I'm an engineer and I've got a short amount of time. I could talk all day, but I got about 15 minutes. So I'm going to get into it and really focus on some of the details. I do work at this amazing place called the uh, Frontier Energy Food Service Technology Center. And I've been out here over 30 years. And we started talking induction and promoting it 25 years ago. And in fact, here's a great photo of me. Let's see, get the little magic pin going. 1992. Uh, let's see, here we go. 1992, I'm sitting there testing range tops, and here I am doing demos on induction right now. So I love this stuff. I love my job. And I find it very interesting. I do want to offer a disclaimer. This is an official uh, Pacific Gas and Electric uh, uh, Company class today. My disclaimer says that everything I tell you is true to the best of my knowledge, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't steer you wrong anyway. And you might wonder who pays for my knowledge and, and why we've been doing this work all these years. And these are public dollars that come through the, the, Pal the California Public Utilities Commission, and they're administered by uh, Pacific Gas Electric Company. So I'm an unbiased uh, public information resource for you. So trust what I say. I also, because we are utility focused and very safety focused, I like to start with a really quick safety message. And this one is related to foodborne illness. It's the summertime, 4th of July is coming up soon. Guess what's gonna make everybody at your party sick? It's when you leave the potato salad out all day, okay? So please follow the food guidelines, make sure you refrigerate things, don't leave stuff out. I got a bad oyster in July one time, um, that's why I'm so big on this. Okay, let's get into the subject at hand. What is induction cooking? So got my little cutaway here. Um, it starts off with electric current that we run through a coil in the induction cooking unit. And that creates a, a magnetic field that actually runs in uh, parallel or, or, excuse me, perpendicular to the coil and sticks up above the surface of the cooktop. That electromagnetic field can't do anything until I put a, something into that electromagnetic field that, that has iron in it, that is magnetic. That field couples up with the pot. It starts rubbing the molecules together. The pot itself gets hot. There's no heat generated by the unit. The pot gets hot. And guess what? That very effectively and efficiently then transfers heat into our food. So I have one here. Here's a unit that we have. You can see it's got a glass top on it. And when I take that top off, underneath, here's the inside, okay? So nothing too crazy, lots of electronics. Here's our coil. In the center of the coil, there's a temperature sensor that's glued to that glass top. And that temperature sensor is constantly monitoring the temperature of that glass top. So one of the huge benefits of induction is that when I want to make lemon curd, I live in Oakland, I have beautiful lemon tree, I love to make lemon curd. I need, I need to make sure that my temperature never goes above 180 degrees or I will wreck my curd, which is hard to make. So this temperature sensor, I put it on my induction cooktop. I set it for 180. It brings the temperature up and I can stir it, but I don't have to sit there and fiddle with it or use a separate thermometer or use a double boiler or anything. I'm getting that precision of the controls and also the temperature feedback. So here's the coil. I run electricity through that. That creates the magnetic field. Kind of cool, right? So now, how do, we, how do we teach people about that notion of only the pot heating up? Well, we have this great demo. You see Chef Mark here, and we have a pan that we've sliced into. Chef Mark is going to take some chocolate. He puts it in the pan. He puts the other piece on the surface of the induction cooktop. He's going to set the, the controls on the unit. And I believe he sets it to about 110. It'll show me in a second. Yeah, 110 one degrees. And voila, what is happening? The chocolate is melting on the pan, but not on the surface. And once again, that's because the electromagnetic field only interacts with the pan itself. And there's no heat generated by the unit. Um, and this is another cool thing. So people ask, well, how far does that field go? And what happens when you take the pan off? So in this video, we have water boiling away. And this is an induction cooktop that has blue lights on it to kind of emulate, you know, cooking with gas. So Mark picks it up out of the field. It stops the water boiling. But look how fast it comes back to boiling. He puts it back in the field, right? So, so people ask, well, can you saute? Can you kind of lift pans in and, in and out and work off that surface? And the answer is yes. Now, once again, getting back to pots and pans, in my house, I have a bunch of La Crise, you know, that sort of porcelainized uh, uh, cast iron. I've got cast iron skillets. Um, pretty much everything in my home kitchen will work on my little induction cooktop, except for the one ceramic, fully ceramic pan that I have, which I'll, I use in the oven now, right? Um, if you can, if, you, if you're ever curious, you look for that induction ready logo. 
But if you don't see that anywhere, just grab your fridge magnet. Whoops, grab your fridge magnet. If a magnet sticks to the pan, then the pan will work. So it's not that big a deal. The, the place where people are going to run into the most challenges with pans are maybe in your dorm where you've got super, super cheap aluminum pans or in some restaurants that may have very, very low cost aluminum pans. But most everything else will work. The magnet test being the important thing. Now, performance, okay? Um, the biggest, when we say, so at my own house, say to my wife, I love induction, you know, we're going to use the induction cooktop. And she's like, that's electric. I hate those things. And why is that? Because she's used the one at my mother-in-law's house, which is an electric resistance cooktop, right? There's a huge difference. So the thing that is holding us back the most, you know, that's holding back residential um, applications of induction is when we say electric range top, people think electric resistance. Induction is totally different. Well, we wanted to prove that. So our friends at Sacramento Municipal Utility District a few years ago commissioned us to do a report. And we brought in several ranges. We brought in three residential induction cooktops, two residential electric resistance, the kind of coil ones. One was the open coil and one was the glass ceramic surface. And then a very nice gas range and we did a bunch of research in our lab under lab conditions and made each appliance do the same amount of work. Uh, the first thing that you find efficiency wise, which is like, where does the heat go? How, how much energy is it taking to cook something? Is that induction is much, much more efficient than a gas range. So here I have, these are, these are some great um, IR videos that I got from an induction manufacturer named Volrath. And on the left side, that's our induction cooktop. And what you see is that about 85% of the energy you put into that cooktop are basically 85 cents on the dollar. You bought a dollar's worth of energy, 85 cents actually makes it into the cooktop that's heating the food, okay? And you can really see that in this case, you can see that induction field and you see the heat is concentrated there. On a, on a gas range top, on a, even on a pretty good day, the, uh, the efficiency tends to be 35% and below for most gas range tops. So that means only 35 cents on the dollar's worth of energy you bought is actually doing useful work. And if you look at the IR, once again, you see, where is my heat going? An awful lot of it is going into the burner's surface itself. And a lot of it is waste heat that's going up out around the sides, right? So there's a huge difference there. What does that mean for me practically as a home cook when I'm making my lemon curd? It means that I'm not getting hit with all this heat on a July day when I'm working in my kitchen. And it means that from a carbon standpoint, I'm using my energy much more effectively and safely. Now, performance wise, we hear this, you know, well, OK, I'll think about induction, but I don't think it performs that well. You know, gas is going to be the fastest. So once again, we lined up all our race uh, our in, uh, ranges and basically kind of had a race. And what you see on this right here on that axis, that is water temperature. And we're gonna take our water from 70 degrees up to 200 degrees. That's a very measurable rate. And what we're approximating here is Wednesday night, you've come home from work, the kids are screaming, we need to get a pot of macaroni and cheese going as fast as possible. I need to heat up a pot of water, right? So that's what we're doing. We're heating that water up to 200 degrees. And what you see the red lines here, the red lines are all the induction cooktops. These two green ones, whoops, I keep trying to draw on the wrong screen. The two green ones are my resistance, and then that uh, blue one is my gas burner. And my induction cooktops perform amazingly well. They, they're the first across the line. So that's these three right here. And you can see that they've heated up my pot of water in like nine and a half to 11 minutes. It's pretty fast. Next across the line, surprisingly, is that electric resistance coil. Now, this is a brand new electric resistance coil. The pot set on it really well. But, you know, our perception is that those things are super bad. It, they're actually beating the gas range, right, in this situation. And this was a nothing fancy electric range. The next across the line is that electric ceramic top. That's the one that's in my mother-in-law's house. And then finally, the last one across the range, uh, across the, the finish line, is actually the, ga the gas range, right, out here at about twice the amount of time that it took the uh, induction cooktops to get across the line. So that's pretty, that's pretty surprising. And this was not an underpowered gas range. That was a very nice gas range and essentially the equivalent of this unit right here made by the same manufacturer, right? So you may be saying, okay, is there some kind of magic going on with induction? Well, there is a really, really important trick, something you can do with a unit that has a bunch of electronics like this is that you can play with the power. And so the secret weapon of the induction cooktop 
is that it has power boost modes, right? So if I look at this big front burner over here, that guy is going up to 3,300 watts. That's a good thousand watts higher than the, the typical electric range can get. So that power boost is what's helping me heat up that pot of water so I can feed those screaming kids. I have four kids, so I know about the macaroni and cheese and the, right? So, but that's something you're only gonna get on an induction cooktop, that power boost mode. So huge winner. Now, the other thing performance wise that I find uh, really wonderful about induction cooktops, and let's get back to my lemon curd, I need to control that temperature. And so as I'm adjusting temperature, I, I want it to adjust quickly. Since there's no real mass in the top of the induction cooktop, you know, it's just like a, just a piece of glass, right? There's nothing, there's nothing that's really containing a lot of heat. When I turn off my induction cooktop, the temperature drops off pretty much immediately. Um, my gas range is not too bad. The gas range is pretty close. It responds fairly well. The thing that's really, that really blows it up is this one here. That's that electric resistance range top with the uh, electric ceramic range top with the resistance elements underneath. That takes a long time to come down, you know, in temperature, which is why my wife always burns the food when she goes to my mother-in-law's house. She's not used to that, that long decay time. You have to take stuff off. It's also a safety factor because you've got a big piece of glass that's hot, right? What I'm trying to say in, in a nutshell is that induction is really, really different from the electric resistance that people have come to not really like. In fact, induction really performs more and, and acts more like a, a gas burner, which is the thing that people tend to like because of the adjustment, the fast response. So if I compare them, you know, fast heat up, my induction has it, my gas burner has it, my electric element does not. Quick response time, induction and gas, yes, the, the old school electric does not. Quick cool down, my induction, my gas has that, the old one electric doesn't, and good for saute, same thing. I can saute on an induction range top, right? So there's no reason, if somebody's used to a gas, uh, a gas burner already, moving over to induction is actually a lot easier than they may realize. It's a, it's a lot closer to the way you wanna do it. Now, I wanna talk just for one moment about some of the challenges. You know, one of the big challenges of trying to put induction into a home is that notion of panel size. OK, how do I, I I'm in a whole like I live in a hundred and five year old house. Um, I'm in the process of trying to up my panel size right now. It's been a real challenge. And so, you know, what what can I do if I want a full size induction range in my house? Well, that challenge is being met now by some manufacturers who are actually coming up with using electronics and battery storage coming up with induction range tops that can just plug and play right into a 120 volt outlet. And, and you over, overcome really two challenges. One is that installation, because now you can bring it into any kitchen, particularly multifamily, so multifamily developers, if you're listening. The other thing is people say, you know, I, I, I read the comments in, in articles about induction. Oh, we get a lot of power outages. I don't want to lose my gas because I get power outages. With these battery backup ranges, you have a power outage, you can still cook. In fact, you can run your refrigerator off of the battery backup, right? So these are sort of win-win technology solutions that are coming along that are gonna make our, our world better. Now, I'm an educator, engineer, outreach person, you know, I want you to get your hands on stuff. If you were in PG&E territory, we have an induction cooktop loaner program. It costs you nothing. We will ship you the unit. You keep it for a couple of weeks. Here is the QR code. Um, we are going to send, because you may, may meet out that fast with your phone, if you are, good. If you're not, we're going to send you handouts of this presentation afterwards so you can get back to these resources. But I, I urge you to take advantage of this. If you are a pg e customer, that's your program. If you're down in SoCal Edison territory, they also have a loaner program. East Bay Community Energy has one, Sonoma Clean Power. Look around and see if your local utility has an induction cooktop loaner program. There's no better way to understand the technology than to get your hands physically on it and try it out. And once you do, you'll be like, you'll be like Rochelle, you'll be like, I, I gotta have one every day, this is great. And, and Brian, I love that you were showing the, uh, the attitudes, right, about changing uh, over to induction range tops. As part of our cooktop loaner program, we've actually been asking people there before and after responses, right? So in this, what I wanna show you is, what we're really looking for is the growth in the green you know, getting rid of the unsures and the and the shrinking of the yellow. So this is the pre-loan right here, pre-loan opinions. And the post-loan opinions are here. And what you see is, yes, the, the green has grown. The unsure has gone away. That's probably the best thing. People who did, just didn't understand it, now they're sure. They've tried it out and they're like, oh, I like this. And we have 
you know, in, in this data, upwards of 80 plus percent people saying, I feel good about induction. And then when we ask them about the likelihood of switching, yes, our numbers are actually a little higher than the consumer reports. We're, we're at 70 plus percent. So it's a technology, get your hands on it, try it out, right? Last little bit here, if you'd like to know more and see more videos about what I've talked about today, we do have a couple of on-demand classes that cost you nothing. You go to the caenergywise.com site and you can take these classes online. Uh, pg and &E hosts these, There's, each one is an hour. One is residential, one's commercial. Go, go take them, try it out and you'll get more information. Last thing I would like to ask just as a favor, because we have a lot of people on the line here, I kind of like to know how our training is doing, whether our public dollars are spent well. If you wouldn't mind grabbing this QR code, just open the survey. And when we're done with the class, you know, when you've heard everybody, just let us know how you felt about that. I, that would really help us out. And with that, I want to say thank you so much. Virtual Richard says thank you so much. And I'm going to pass it over to our next panelist. Thanks. Awesome, Richard. Well, I, I gave you a uh, yeah a ten out of ten on that. That was amazing. <laughs> uh, if, it, Richard, if you could put um, those links in the chat, and we'll send them out in the email follow up as well. That'd be okay. fantastic. Um, great. great. So, Rochelle, go ahead and take it away. I want a virtual Rochelle <laughs> character, but I am a character, so I'm good. And uh, for those of you that are joining, like it's so fun. We have somebody from Belize on here, somebody in Inverness. Hello. Um, Boston is in the house, which you probably know Steve Sheinkoff. He's kind of a big deal. Um, so it's really exciting to see everybody on this uh, on this Zoom and um, and of course uh, Brian and Joe, I will I will webinar with you any old time. <laughs> um, but I really I I have to point out like I'm such a fan girl. I am an induction cooking super fan. But Richard Young, Steve Sheinkoff, you are like icons in my life. So I I you I learn everything from you and I love you with all my heart. So it's really this is just super fun for me. Um, so yes, what does all that mean from a cooking part perspective? So when I was with Joe and Brian before, I worked um, and I still sometimes work with my, for myself. I was with Kitchens to Life. But I have really an exciting, I'm going to bring you on a little journey. So this is, uh, what does all this stuff mean from a cooking perspective? So if we go to the next slide, I just want to tell you really quick, I've been a cooking teacher for decades at this point. Um, I worked in restaurants for years on the East Coast back in the day. So I've got my burns and my scars and my cred from doing all that work. Um, but then when I moved to California, I actually got scouted for, to be a private chef. So I was scouted um, and I, yes, I got to be the private chef for George Lucas. So this girl being a huge Star Wars fan, I had to totally downplay that. Um, but it was an honor to be part of that world for many years and Metallica and some legendary sports figures and all of that to say, wow, like what an adventure. However, it's one thing to be a chef for the likes of Martin Scorsese coming to dinner and things like that. It's another thing altogether to find your own hero's journey, right? So like, how can I be my own Princess Leia? And so as I became, I became a corporate chef in the appliance industry and few people, I mean, when I say, when people see that I know Steve Sheinkoff in the appliance industry, he's kind of an icon. They like, like me more. Um, but I did some really great work as a corporate chef uh, in the, in the appliance industry, kind of doing what you were doing, Richard, but more in the more in the kitchen side of it. Um, so then July 2019, people started to talk about the city of Berkeley um, changing rules about not putting any new gas lines. At that moment, da -da -da -da, I felt like I had my opportunity because I really understand you guys have been selling and talking about BTUs and gas ranges for decades. So I really get it. I understand the confusion, the consternation, but 
I am an induction super fan. Is everything perfect? No, we're going to tell you some of the challenges, but we're also going to bust some myths. So now I have the honor to be the senior lead for culinary events and experiences for the Building Decarbonization Coalition. We are a group based, well, we're national at this point. I am in Pacifica, California, uh, near San Francisco. We create coalition from building people that are in the building industry, wow. politicians, all <laughs> kinds of amazing people. Oh, do I hear somebody on the line? Mm. I hear a voice. Um, so we we create coalition to help buildings move away from uh, being fueled by methane gas. So it's very exciting, but I very much understand the you know the challenges of it. Um, but I am also not only am I on my greatest adventure yet, but also I am going to be uh, working with Richard, um, working on creating a chef's team, which I'll talk about in, in a minute. So we'll go to the next slide. I want to talk about the culinary parts. Um, as a cooking teacher, you guys, I get it. Cooking for some people is a joy. Some people, Richard, I don't know from four kids, I got two cats, they're pretty simple. But um, it, a lot of times it's a chore, it's a lot of work, right? I respect that. Um, I also know that culinary traditions matter a lot, very much. Um, there are a lot of outdated myths around electric kitchens, like you had alluded to, Richard. Um, when you say electric, I get it, people try to turn the other way. Um, there's definitely a learning curve with cooking, as well as when you ramp up to the speed and power of induction. And when we talk to people about changing, you know, uh, you know, changing over and trying this out, when you think about a whole electric home, right? Like you guys in Boston, Steve, all you up there, there are so many electric heat pumps going in, in the cold weather, there's all kinds of uh, other things. But when you say, you know, electrify my kitchen, that is the hardest part for a lot of people. The kitchen is the heart of the home. Um, but once they try it, once they learn this stuff and feel confident themselves, it actually can become the most exciting part um, of the transformation. So I live in that world and I love it. So we'll go to the next slide. Let's talk about we often focus on the induction cooktops. Now I want to just briefly, I was thinking about this is, Richard, you showed a plug-in or a hob, which I also have um, from the lending library, lending libraries, or you can buy them online. There's also, as we talk about induction cooktops or gas cooktops, they go into the counter and they are surrounded by countertop. Steve will talk more about this. There's also a whole a range, which is the whole thing together, the cooktop and the oven. And then even there on the left, you can see a gas range top, just the top of a pro range. So just quickly, I don't want to go into Steve's territory, but just a little bit of nomenclature, which kind of helps. But remember that as much as we focus on induction cooking, as sort of the center, I want people to know that you can think differently about kitchen design and kitchen planning. So we used to sort of always center around that gas range or that range top. Um, now there is what I call the whole electric kitchen. There are microwaves and speed ovens that are amazing. My favorite, and I know the Yale appliance team, there are steam and combi ovens. And even now using your uh, convection ovens to the max. Some of them have air fry technology and all of these things. So there's a lot more to today's electric kitchen. So I just wanted to mention that quickly, um, but let's go to the next slide. So myths, we talked about a lot of these. So I don't even need to go back into them, but I think if I go down to one of the biggest myths we hear a lot is you can't cook Asian cuisines, you can't walk cook, you can't cook Indian cuisines, often sort of an attack, seeming like an attack on tradition. And it could not be further from the truth, but I get where that's coming from. You can see me there with an amazing um, uh, woman, so fun, 
she worked with me several years ago and she says she her name is so fun and she says because she is so fun that's her own words she was a blast and she's a traditional cook uh moving into a new home with induction really worried about it what did we do we cooked we walk cooked um you can also ask celebrity chef martin yan he's a legend yan can cook I work with him regularly, super brag, I know. Um, and he is not only an induction fan, but he is an advocate. The kitchens in Beijing, especially the commercial kitchens, are almost all induction and electric. Mind blowing, right? So it's really exciting to see this transformation happen. Chefs are starting. And the last one is like real chefs don't use it. We are now seeing Chef Eric repair, Yan Ken cook. We're seeing more and more and more chefs embrace this. If you look and see what chefs often now have at their homes, you will see more and more induction starting to pop up and more and more restaurants. And as I mentioned, we're convening the Building Decarbonization uh, Coalition is convening the first ever uh, chef culinary council. It's the electric kitchen culinary council. I'm gathering all of my besties together and we're just going to rock this message across the country and beyond. So I know hey, Rochelle, that Rochelle, can I ask questions about the walk? Cause I know we, we got a question yes, in the chat. Course. So do you need a special, like, is, is it a special walk pan or a special, uh, some kind of attachment thing or how does that work? I have it. So I also have my hob here. So the most important thing is certainly flat bottom, right? So I have everything from a very bougie walk. This is my um, Chinatown uh, walk here. Flat bottom is important. Magnetic, like you talked about, right? Of course. And then as big of a surface area as you can have on the bottom works, which is really, really wonderful. So as long as the magnet sticks, you're good. Uh, surface area is key. So um, really exciting. The other thing too is as you are cooking, right? You don't have those, all of those BTUs, that's that extra heat getting you hot. And often your handles are gonna stay a lot cooler. You know, after a while, you know, doing a long, long saute or long simmer, your handles will warm up, but there's all these kind of added benefits, especially when you're doing that high heat walk cooking. And Richard, you guys have like the commercial walks and those things are super yeah. powered. Yeah, they're, they're way more powerful than anything you've, you're going to find in the in the biggest um, Chinese restaurant. They're, they're so powerful that you have to back down. <laughs> you have to derate them. <laughs> You really do. And so it's exciting, but we got to get this word out, right? So those are some of the, 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 the myths. And then we've already sort of talked about some of these things. Steve will talk more about pricing. Your individual units can cost more. There are lots of different interfaces, right? Some there's There are knobs, like you saw with the Channing Street. I got to rock that unit um, this last weekend, which is super fun. Um, so there are knobs, there are push buttons. And from a sales perspective, that can be challenging sort of picking it out. But guess what? You only need to learn yours. Winning, right? Um, and then we talked about some of these other things. So yes, currently when the power is out, you are not going to be able to cook. There's so much happening in terms of creating a, uh, a, a much more, a much stronger grid that is happening right now. There are the, the uh, technologies you're talking about, Richard, where it's battery powered, and you are even going to now see your cars being able to now power your home. So a lot of brilliant things happening and changing at the same time. And we can go to the next slide. So again, lots of these myths we've already talked about. Richard talked about those things. One of them, if we look at the fourth little, um, the fourth bullet I have on the left, for people that are used to sort of looking down and you see those visual cues, you think, oh, I'm gonna miss those. Keep in mind, right? You look down, you make an adjustment, you don't really get that much visual information from looking down at your gas, but you're used to it, right? 
most of your visual cues, whether you're cooking on gas or electric, happen with the food, the sounds, the smells, right? And when you get used to that level of, like you say, Richard, temperature control or instant control, you really don't need to be tipping your eye down at flame level in the same way. So yes, it takes a, a day or two to kind of adjust, but once you go there, it's really hard to give up on the safety, the power, the control, all of these other things, but I get it. It's something new for people to learn and I, I really respect that. If we look at the other side, think about this. You've got your range top or your cooktop in a typical gas, set up, it's like a big hole, right? And you got to get down and clean in and lift everything up. What about not losing any of that surface area, right? Not only you don't have to clean down in there, but because, it, and you can put things on top of it. I could put my recipe, my book right on top of my induction cooktop because it's not magnetic. It won't catch on fire. So having that whole surface area from a chef's perspective or a home cook or anybody, it's awesome. And then the safety. Chefs always brag about our arm burns. Can that just be a thing of the past, please? Um, you know, like why? Um, and really, like, yes, if you really try, you can really put your arm up against your pan and burn yourself, but it's a lot more effort on your part. Um, and then, you know, not catching things on fire is kind of, you know, cool. I think so there's a lot and then there's incredible features like you can do app driven cooking I have this hob that I love this is my Heston Q and Steve you know this lives inside some of the the other cooktops this baby is app driven when I was at the Boston seafood show years ago or I would have stopped you Steve um I was able to do picture perfect crispy skin salmon all day long on this baby because it drove itself. So there's all kinds of safety, temperature control, sous vide things built in. Do you need to get all those bougie things? No, you do not. Steve's going to talk about that, but if you want it, it's there. So, and we have mentioned easy cleanup. So we'll go to the next slide because I definitely want to kick it over to Steve because he's a wealth of knowledge. So where do you get all this information? Well, we have some great resources I want to share, but there are places like there are all kinds of changes happening in commercial facilities. So Richard and his crew are really working to train chefs. We are the toughest people to change. And chefs have very little experience seeing this in real life. There is a restaurant in San Francisco called 165 SF. It is all electric. Those chefs are so happy. They are so comfortable. None of them could conceive of working now in gas and getting burned and being hot. So it's really amazing, but it's harder to find that. There are training kitchens and cooking schools that are starting to adapt. And my favorite resource, the Steve Shinecoffs of the world, as if there was another, is your appliance vendors and your trainers and your dealers. They are out there with live kitchens in some circumstances to help you kind of see it, especially on the residential side. Now, my favorite resource, which I will make sure to add, is the switcheson.org. That is the Building Decarbonization Coalition's consumer-facing um, uh, website, and it has all kinds of exciting things, um, and we're really excited to share that. So I will make sure to get that added in, but I want to kick it over to the Appliance King, Steve Scheinkopf, and we will definitely get to questions at the end. Thanks, Rochelle. That was fantastic. Well, um, I don't know what to say other than to say, I know where I'm getting my Metallica tickets from. <laughs> you know I mean? No, I, I, uh, I really appreciate it. You know, it's really interesting listening to everyone talk and uh, about induction and everyone makes like, this is like brand new technology. Um, and, you know, induction was um, first patented in 19 in like early not er, the early 20th century. The first cooking products were designed in 1951. I sold G induction in 1986, um, the cooktops, and then it just like disappeared until um, 
there's a Canadian company, Diva, was selling them for four thousand dollars in two thousand. Um, the other thing is, I, I don't know if I, you know, I think for a lot of people with the walk, have you ever tried using a trivet with an existing walk, you know, that would flatten it down a little bit, and because those seem to work as well. But anyway, I'm here to uh, to talk about um, induction products. Um, in, in kind of best practices and in and, and a different and and some um and some uh new products as well and what not to do let's start with the what not to do first okay um california and massachusetts are gas come are gas areas right so what a lot of people think is you know they they get all gung-ho about induction and, and induction works on so many levels, you know, you're talking about, the reason why restaurateurs are so happy is they don't have all that heat. Induction is a very cool surface, right? But when you talk about, you know, people are getting gung-ho, say, yeah, I wanna buy induction and they've got gas, just hold on for a second. You're talking about a 12 amp unit that you have to convert to 50. Now you need an electrician to do that and you need to um, update your uh, electrical and you have to wire from the box to the circuit, right? And in Boston, you have to deal with um, plumber's coats. You need a gas. You need your plumber to uninstall. You need probably uh, for cooktops, you need um, a, a granite cutter. Um, and so there's a lot of moving parts that have to happen. But it costs about $3,500 to convert a uh, induction, a gas to an induction, just so you know. And it goes hand in hand with the next slide. You're looking at my inventory of induction ranges. We have about a thousand of them on order. You're going to have availability issues for any number of reasons. And um, so what you want to do is, is, is order, and, and I'm going to give you some brands now, and there's probably a lot more that you can order from. And I'll give you some ideas of what to buy, but you want to plan a one to six months to get an induction range. Um, probably a little bit further for the premier companies like uh, Wolf, perhaps. Um, but that's it. So you've got the cost of getting the, the electrician and the plumber. You got to line them up. You know, I'm not sure if it's any easier. I hope it's easier in California than it is in Boston. And then you have to pick it up. The two have to go hand in hand, right? And then you've got reliability. Um, you know, we did 34,000 service calls last year, 40,000 the year before. Induction cooktops are fairly reliable with 6.2% service within the first year. Induction ranges are a little... Uh, less than the uh, norm at, at 10.5, the average appliance is 9.5. What you see is a lot of spikes, and and those can and those can knock out the uh, the the uh, the ranges because you need 50 amps for the range and only 30 for the cooktops. So we have a master licensed electrician on staff. He says to get in what's called what he calls a smoother, something that smooths out the spikes. You get it on Amazon for about 600 dollars. So. Let's talk about how to pick. And I thought everyone was from California. So I gave it a California slide. It's called a bridge, you know, the Golden Gate Bridge on the left. And that's kind of, I think a lot of what I'm going to show you is very similar, but um, bridge elements, you know, the ability to connect and griddle with induction of having uh, the two burners be able to connect with a power burner in the middle and then the power and then the bridges on the other side. If you get, that's on a 36 inch looking at a Bosch benchmark. On a 30 inch, you might get a bridge on the other side and a power unit. Now, one of the things I, I, I showed this picture and there'll be another one that I'm gonna show as well is venting is crucial no matter what cooking appliance. Now, now gas has already been said that you're gonna get formaldehyde, nitrous oxide, nitri nitrous dioxide, carbon monoxide, uh, formaldehyde, benzene, um, burning fat and induction, you're gonna get some of the same chemicals. So it's, uh, it's very important to vent properly. And we don't recommend downdrafts because it has no capture. So when you walk cook, you're gonna create a lot of smoke, grease, and steam. It's not gonna be able to vent through a little two inch aperture and then you're gonna reverse gravity down and then do another bad recommendation of transitioning, which reduces the static flow and you're gonna go outside. It's not really, downdrafts are last resort only. You always wanna vent with a 23 inch depth vent to capture everything. And with induction, you don't need as much because you're not, you don't have the heat loss. Minimum 400 CFM, if you cook a lot and walk, you might want 600 or more, okay? So that's the way you pick. Now let's let's look at ranges, right? Look at some of the ranges. First of all, sizing is, you probably know it's 30, but the, the biggest, the, where, the, where the development's going is in the larger size, especially 36, you got Wolf, 
fish and Paco, get some of the products we don't sell, uh, Decor, Viking, um, Smeg, Bosch has their Smeg unit um, in 36 and there'll be a whole host. And then 48, you got two off-brand manufacturers. You may want to wait on a 48 and then when that comes out, 60 inch. And I'll get into the reason why they're going to the larger units as well. But 30 and 36, you can get a pretty good range, uh, a very good induction range. So let's talk about some of the brands you might want to consider. Fisher Paykel, I think it's got a great top. When, you know, I showed that with the two bridges and the power burner in the middle. That's the it's available in 30 and 36. Mule, you're going to buy for the for the uh, range. And um, um, I think chefs can speak to this. This one that makes steam easy. First of all, they have the master chef controls. I don't know if uh, Rochelle, you've worked on those. It's basically you put in the food, how you want to cook. It gives you time, temperature, you hit a button. It also has steam, but it makes steam functionality easy. So steam's good for caramelizing food and making bread. Like if you want to hit, if you want to make a California sourdough, you just hit a button, call California sourdough, and it makes the bread for you. Becca was a very interesting product because they just reduced the pricing and the ranges today. So I put the slide in about $1,500. So you can buy a really good induction with 3,700, two 3,700 watt uh, uh, power burners at less than $2,500. If you're looking at cafe, you've got the only double oven, um, seven cubic feet. They have the bridge element on the top as well. Bosch is the most reliable. It's only uh, less than 6% repair in the first year. They also had a warming drawer. Warm drawers are nice if you cook at one time, you serve in another. You can keep food without dehydrating and make it bad, like microwavy. Um, and then you got Wolf, which is a lot like Mila, just without the steam. Though, if you tell it when to cook and um, you tell it what you want to cook and how you like it, it'll give you a time temperature and it'll even give you a rack position as well. Okay. This is it. You know, this is the power use. Now, we talk about, um, I think Richard talked about power boost. Each one has that, each manufacturer will have the ability to boost the 3,700. The, the new LG that's going to come out, um, that's the most powerful, 4,200 watt, and that doesn't even require a boost. Of course, when you boost in most manufacturers, you're taking the power from the backside. So you're only going to cook, you're not going to cook as fast, you're not going to cook as fast as the burner on the, on the, on the other side is the, uh, of the power unit. Okay, just remember that. And on Bosch, on Bosch, you lose that, that power completely on the, on the back burner. So let's talk about uh, induction cooktops. Again, you have a number of sizes. If you want to just cut in an induction cooktop, you have endless amounts of sizes to do that. If you've got 12 inch, meal is the most prominent. And there's a bunch of other off-brand manufacturers that do it. Wolf is 15, as is Gaginal. 24 is a standard European cooktop by that meal of Gaginal, probably a bunch of other brands. And then you go into the more uh, American size, 30 and 36. Uh, the most common, and then Thermal will make the larger 45 inch as well. These are the brands. Again, what you want to do is you want to look at output, reliability, and the ability to bridge those elements. Now, Fisher Paykel, uh, Meal has got a really powerful top. Bosch, Bosch is the most reliable in all their brands, whether it's Gaginal and Thermal on their top. Wolf's got a great 36 inch when it comes back out. On the, on the 36 inch, you couldn't gang four burners together, make one big super burner. And now for something revolutionary that happened 10 years ago, this is the Thermador Freedom. You can get it in Gagano as well, where you can put the pot anywhere on the cooktop and you can move it and the, and the power will reset wherever you move it. So that's, that's brand new at 10 years old. Um, why more ranges don't have it and more cooktops don't have it? I don't know, but I think you'll see more technology come in induction. This is what the wattage looks like for induction cooktops. Again, you're looking at, oddly enough, uh, the Freedom is, I think, about six grand, and you can get a decent uh, induction cooktop at two to $5,000. Now, what are you going to buy? Induction, uh, you're going to buy a cooktop of the range. This goes in a kitchen design. Ranges are better for, for small kitchens. You can centralize everything. For, uh, for cooktops, wall ovens are better because you can do a couple of things. Michelle talked about customizing your cooking. And you can do that very easy with a wall oven, put separate steam or speed, a warming drawer underneath it. Um, but you need an extra cabinet for that. Plus, you never stoop for the wall oven. So it really depends on the size. Again, you look at this picture, there's no ventilation there. And if you talk about 
unhealthy environments, whether we're doing gas, electric, or induction, you have to vent for them. Again, range is decentralized, well, wall of and again, a wall of them because you're not checking all the time, you can place it anywhere in your, in your kitchen. Sure. Let's talk about, I too have a Heston Q, and unfortunately I lost the little smart device on the pan, so I'm only using it as a pan. Let me tell you a little bit about portables. Um, 120 power, this, I use this, I moved to an apartment, oddly enough, with an electric uh, resistant, with the electric smooth top range. Now, what a portable will do is it will allow you to, it, you get the instant response of, of induction. But if you're trying to boil a whole big spaghetti pot, it's no better than, at least I find, no better than an electric oven, okay? So you're not getting the output, but you're getting the, the response. You know, we talk about cleanability. The reason why this is so cleanable is because the glass doesn't get hot. The only heat you get is the residual heat from the pot to the uh, glass, not from the glass to the pot. So it doesn't, you spill something, it doesn't bake into the glass. So I use it because it's simple to clean and it's very responsive. You can go from like one to 10 instantly and from 10 to one instantly as well. So a little bit about portables. And I, I imagine that's the same I know we talked about battery power, but I don't know any of them that's out. And I, I don't sell portables anyway. I just thought I'd comment on it. So let's talk about the future of induction. I, I think you're going to see um, a lot more of this. I don't know where we got this picture. We don't sell this unit where everything's smart. You can, you can reverse it. You can run your Pinterest off it and run your music off, off a, of a cooktop. I think you'll see it, but it really has to do with the past. Um, in California, seven years ago, there was a group of people called the California Electric Group. And they started a, a movement to eliminate gas products. And I remember conversation was, um, we want to um, electrify everything. And I thought that was pretty noble. Um, but what they did was they eliminated gas in multifamily. So every tower that's in now in certain municipalities in, in uh, California, now in Boston, Brookline, Cambridge, New York, can't use gas. So if you're talking about selling your high-end properties, multi-level, you can only go electric and induction. That's induction. So the way developers buy is they don't buy just an induction range from one company and, and like all the other stuff from another company, you get the whole package. So appliance companies, and you know, I had a chat with the uh, CEO of Blue Star. She goes, we know we have to be induction. We're going to lose a ton of business. And it's not just the one it's not just the one unit of induction. They're going to lose everything with it. So you're talking about tens of thousands of units that aren't going to sell them because this woman and about six of her friends decided to electrify a kitchen. So I want to say, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm a Bostonian and you know um, my day is almost over. That's the good thing about East Coast time. But if you're going to convert, just remember, you're going to need to plan. Gas to induction does need planning and does require some expense. Make sure whatever brand you have in your area can be fixed. I always recommend Google service, whatever brand, and see what comes up. You know, the best induction range are cooked up right now because a lot of them are very similar in, in terms of output and technology. Maybe the one you can buy, uh, the available one, and then you pick the features. I, I do think induction is a better way of cooking for a lot of reasons mentioned here. You know, we do offer a buying guide. It's free. You know, just put in your name, and quite honestly, we never buy the after the fact, and we do publish stuff three times a week on our blog and on our YouTube channel. And once again, thank you guys for having me and, um, and uh, I'll be happy to answer whatever questions you have. Thank you so That's much. That's great. Steve. Thanks, Stephen. Hey, I just want to reinforce that, you know, the, the, uh, the buying guide and the, the blog are really fantastic. So definitely check these out. Um, and I think you'll find that it's, it's really good information from Yale. Hey, I want to, um, maybe we could, uh, Maybe we could just start by, um, um, Steve, if you could stop sharing your screen, we'll just go to sure, the, sure. our live faces here. But I, I, for questions, I, I wanted to begin a little bit with the um, the installation thing. Cause so first of all, um, I know, you know, I, I just wanna make it clear to people that, you know, you're, how difficult it's gonna be to put an induction range in depends on what you currently have in a big way and to some degree, a few other factors. So I just wanna dive into this a little bit more. Like for example, if you've got an electric range now, 
it should just be a, basically a plug and play swap, right? Is that correct? Um, like if you've got a if you got an electric range right now and you replace it with an induction range, it's basically just take one out and put another one in. Is that true? It depends how much amperage you have, whether it's forty or fifty amp. Okay. You know, this is like the number one question we get. Mm -hmm. and unfortunately, uh, unfortunately, you may have to upgrade, especially you know you you um, Brian, you asked me about dual fuel. Dual yeah. fuel is typically thirty amp, so you have to re repeat the process on on a dual fuel. Now, if you're going to a cooktop. You're probably okay because the, most of the most of the cooktops only require thirty amps. But again, okay. funny, I don't know what it is like where you're from, but you know we have a staff electrician because we have to because getting an electrician and a plumber, it's like it's 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 really tough at least here. So, so Steve, okay. just, to, I just, just wanted to, to underline that it's uh, the fifty amp is for most induction ranges. You're you're going to be looking at a fifty amp. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because I'm just because I'm just trying to square this with my own personal experience. Because we we did one switch from gas to elect to induction, and we had a dual fuel range before it was a Blue Star, and then we it was basically again I just pulled the old one out, pulled the, pulled the gas one out, turned the gas off myself, and they put the induction one in, plugged it in, and it was good. It took it it was really simple. But I, I understand that that's not always the case. I, I also replaced an electric one where it was, again, the same thing. The, the, the delivery guy just came, took, took the electric one away and plugged my induction one in and I was good. Well, you but had, I know you it can be, uh, it, it isn't necessarily that way. So maybe I've just been really lucky. But well, you got uh, very lucky because Blue Star didn't come out with a dual fuel till lot, like two weeks ago. So well, you maybe, had, it was, maybe it wasn't. <laughs> you had existing power there. Probably. Yeah, we had existing power there. Oh, and it was the range before there was dual fuel, I guess, maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, we had existing power. But okay, so there's so you need the wire, 240 volts and 50 amps. And then again, you might have the electrical panel issue potentially if you've got if your panel is crammed full and you you might need a bigger panel, but you know, that's that's another complication that people might run into as well. Potentially. Well, somebody, somebody asked that. So maybe we can put that to you all. Um, you know, no, if I'm, you have I'm a hundred really... amp panel, do you have to upgrade it if you go to induction? I I can I answer a little bit of that because my own personal story has become a uh, legend now. I'm actually <laughs> semi-famous because <laughs> of what I told the Washington Post. Uh, in my house, my 105 year old house, yes, I wanted uh, electric car and induction. And so I'm in the process of upgrading my home panel. And it's been, and I started before the pandemic. So it's been a multi year challenge to get contractors and get everything filled in. And yeah, it's going to cost me significantly. But what I have to say is that uh, along with that, I'm getting rid of all the knob and tube wiring in my house, mm -hmm. putting yeah you know, uh, actually putting outlets in bedrooms that came with, you know, one outlet in 1918. They they didn't know, why would you need an outlet in a room? <laughs> right, so, right. So yes, and, and that is one of those reasons that the 120 volt battery power units are going to be so revolutionary is for cases like mine, um, that you could just put, remove the old one and plug the new one in and avoid the, the panel upsizing. And there's a whole trend in that in that direction as well, heat pump water heaters, heat pump heaters, all moving to, in, towards the 120 volt level for uh, homes like mine, which are difficult to uh, to upgrade, right? Right. Yeah, and and, the, the other thing is, you know, I, I saw a question and, you know, Boston's a really tough place from a cost standpoint. You know, if you live certainly in every other area, I don't think it's $3,500, it'd probably be, half to three quarters of that if that so you know that's yeah. that's that's the worst case scenario here in boston so yeah mine, yeah. mine is significantly high <laughs> yours is higher? Well, it feels like you're doing well, you're doing a whole well, you're getting I'm, ready for all those other devices you want to plug in there too which is great um and i know that, that is definitely a theme throughout this electrification you know transition that we hear you know you we we have the same conversation with you know heat pumps and um, et cetera, for older homes in particular. If you've got a newer home, typically built after 1980 or so, or or 2000 for sure, you're going to have a, a large panel and probably not going to have near as, as much trouble with some yeah, of these I mean, things. But older homes can be tricky. 
behind plaster walls and stuff. But I realized you can see over my shoulder, there's my electric vehicle. So I did get my EV and my home charging. So I'm <laughs> All right, there. Richard. Good for you. Uh, Good for you. Uh, Rochelle, were you going to say something? I have another question, but then go ahead if you want to Yes, comment. and just like, so keep in mind as a, so I'm part of a coalition. I unfortunately... Steve, I do not have the power to decide that we are going to switch to a, a electric or induction. However, and I really, because I'm like you, I'm a appliance insider. I really, one of the things we do at Building Decarb is work with manufacturers, work with everybody to understand what are the opportunities, what are the pivots, where is all the, you know, there's lots of money and funding coming. So it's really amazing. And a lot of the focus is certainly on new building. So while people have their own reasons, like Richard and, and I, where we're like, get it out of here, you know, if people have a perfectly good thing that they want to use and, and and like use that, but it's really about the changing, you know, making these changes. We, we, I don't have children, I have cats, so nobody's going to necessarily outlive me, but for people who do, I, you know, I, I, I work on this as though I had children because, you know, our planet is, is going through some stuff. So, you know, the business opportunity is amazing. Not everybody, but I don't want to give the impression that everybody has to, rip everything out and make these changes. It's really not what we're saying. We're saying that as you go forth in your path in life, in new building, new construction, if you do want to remove your gas because you're like Richard and I, there, you know, we want to be honest about those things. But again, as coalition builders, we work with um, you know, Viking and all these manufacturers that sell a lot and and love their gas products. But boy, they also really love their induction products. So it's just fun to elevate that story. What's, um, what's curious when you talk about 110 is that a 110 heat pump Mila um, takes the same amount of time as a 220 volt Bosch because um, they have mineral sensors and everything else. But I, I think the technology will get there if, if, if they're going to invest and they're going to invest because they have to invest. It's not a matter of... Um, of, of, of them even wanting to. If you're going to sell a multifamily uh, tower in three major cities, then, then you're going to have to invest in, in better induction technology. It's, it's, it has to happen. So, you know, Steve, just on that point, you know, we're, we're seeing like on the heat pump side, for example, you know, all the, um, the manufacturers that I talked to, you know, there's a lot of them who've been making gas furnaces forever and now they're in, and have been making heat pumps also. And, and if you talk to them, you hear the same story you hear around automobiles that all the R&D is going into heat pumps. They're not doing R&D on gas furnaces anymore. I imagine it's similar. I don't know. Is it similar with um, with appliances? Is the, Are these manufacturers kind of devoting their R&D to, to induction? Is that what are they seeing the writing on the wall? Do you think? I think I think I think the appliance business is run by accountants. You know, the more you can get out of that machine, the more profitable you will be. You know, I mean, and, you know, you look at a dryer, you know, there's nothing wrong with the dryer. It's reliable, but it's basically a hair dryer in a drum, you know, and it hasn't changed in 70, 80 years. We talk about heat pumps as being new technology, but new is 1990. Anybody driving around with a 30 year old car? I don't think so. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I do think um, there's going to be a change, but I think that change is, is being dictated. It's not a voluntary thing, you know, because well, you know, when you look at, revolutionary induction cooktops and, and induction is way better than gas. Um, the most revolutionary product came out 10 years ago. So, yeah, that's question, interesting. Question that came up for folks that I think we should, uh, we should address, you know, by, from, I think three, um, uh, uh, participants were asking about, you know, pacemakers and other electronic devices and induction. I know this, this comes out a lot, Rochelle, I know. Uh, and maybe just the EMF also, maybe yeah. we could wrap that into that same question. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And BDC has a resource um, that, that's been created, but could you guys talk to us about uh, induction and pacemakers in EFF? Yeah. Yeah. So I always have to say I'm a chef, not a doctor, damn it. Um, for, for those of you that are Star Trek fans. Star Trek fans. Well. <laughs> um, however, um, we do. We have some really great resources, um, Building Decarbonization Coalition, that break it down. But very specifically, the M EMF, um, it's a very low field, correct, Richard? It does not reach up very high. Um, and 
Well, you definitely need to check on it. Um, I've had some amazing clients that have come with EMF detectors, like to visit me at Mila and tested out all of the emissions, um, you know, the magnetic, it, it was amazing. And they were absolutely thrilled. So in, in, I think most cases, it's quite a bit less than even a microwave. Um, and you would have to be remarkably close. Uh, I, I believe like you'd kind of have to lay on it, um, which I wouldn't suggest doing on gas either. So um, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to be cute about it. It's serious, but um, it, uh, Richard, is there additional? Um, you know, you're nodding to that. It, it is, it is very safe. But again, um, if people do, they should also check with their doctor if there's a concern, especially yeah. with a very old pacemaker. I think is the case. Yes, yeah, correct. The the field with a uh, off of an induction cooktop is it's pretty small. It it um, it, it generally you know fades pretty quickly. And you would, and the and what we've seen in research and and national health and England and folks like that, they're basically say if you have the old style asynchronous pacemaker, um, that could be bad if you got right on the surface of the cooktop, like you say, you know, right down on it. So in that case, don't get an induction cooktop. For modern pacemakers, it does not seem to be a problem. And in general, I just want to answer the bigger EMF question. Uh, it's been epidemiologically proven. Uh, that EMF is not harmful to humans. The electricity coming through your walls, coming off the microwave, this kind of stuff um, is, is not damaging your health. I, I, I know that was one of those uh, almost, you know, but like it's one of those things we tend to worry about, but it's low frequency. It's, it's, it's not hurting you. Great. Yeah, I wanted, to, there was a, one question about noise from these things. And I know that, and I think there's two, from my understanding, there's two issues there. In some cases, the units themselves can make a little humming sound when you use them, particularly on boost mode. But I, I, I think I've heard, but I'd love to, you guys to dive into this, is that sometimes it, they can make a lot of noise. And a lot of that can be if you've got the wrong pan. Yes. Like if you've got a pan that maybe has got a, some, maybe it has a little aluminum in it or something like that. But can you guys speak to that? The noise? Yeah. You got fan noise and then pan resonance. And the fan noise is the easiest one to answer because as you go to a bigger unit, the fan noise becomes pretty much insignificant. You hear that on the little tiny disc tabletop units. The pan resonance, yes, that's real. Like somebody in the comments was saying her daughter can hear it. My daughter can hear it. I can barely hear it, but not enough to bug me. But as the pan tends to heat up or you load it, that tends to go away. But Steve, I also want to uh, hear what you have to say, because it sounds like you've got some experience with that. You, well, I, it's just experience of mine. You know, it's, it's, it's funny you mentioned that. It, some of it's pans, but, you know, um, I think when it starts up, when my, at least on my Heston, and, and you know, that's, a, that's, a, um, <laughs> that's not a real broad database of information. It seems to, it seems to go away after a certain period of time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think a lot of it is the type of pan you have um, as well. If, if you the better the nickel content to the pan, you mm -hmm. know, the, the better response you get, the less noise you get. Mm -hmm. That's why I was so excited to see your data that the loner hobs have have had a good result because the loner hobs, as as we've mentioned, they can be kind of loud. They're not as powerful, like you mentioned, Steve. Um, um, as much as I love mine, it doesn't do the water boiling in the same way. It's hard to build like a relationship in the same way as you would, you know, speaking as a chef, as you would with like an induction cooktop or an induction range where you're kind of getting to know it. You're like a DJ on that thing. So it's great to see that even with something that may be louder, may have more vibration, all those things, that you're still getting these really good results. And that's lovely. And congratulations. That's exciting. And somebody had asked if you if you look at the data, you'll notice that the, the unsure went totally away, and the and the sort of I don't like it went up a little bit. And some of those people were folks that just said I like gas, I don't like electric, and and they were just confirmed their bias. Other people, um, they said they didn't like the induction, but it was not because of the cooking performance. Uh, it was because of the fan noise or the or that ringing. So what we did is we came back and offered them a loaner with a. A, a different unit that's got a little higher quality um, uh, electronics and that kind of stuff and is less prone to either fan noise or ringing, right? The small countertop unit is a learning tool. It's a toe in the water. And I'm glad you mentioned that, Rochelle, because it's 
when you get your full size unit in your home, it's a totally different beast. We, but you know, we can't loan out um, five thousand dollar full size ranges to people. We, but we want them to learn about the technology. So those little units are are learning, and certainly for commercial restaurant people, commercial kitchens, um, that's same thing. You, you, the units that are going to go into a commercial kitchen are you know uh, five times more powerful than those little countertop units. It's a it's a whole different world, but at least it gets you understanding the technology. And at the end of the day, when you just like, like I've made my lemon curd and there's stuff splotted on the top and I wipe it down and put it away. It's so easy. I'm not taking my gas range apart and getting into all of the burners and all that kind of stuff. So it's really simple. Yeah. Well, we're, um, we're yeah, maybe well, one last question. Yeah. I, I wanted to ask, uh, this was a good one. Cause I know that, you know, some of the, the, Steve, some of the models you showed from a range standpoint, you know, I think you can get into one for right around a thousand dollars, or I think there's some that are even maybe slightly less than that, but, but it's a thousand dollars seems to be about the entry price and then go up to five or more, you go to 10,000 even maybe, but can you, besides the size, the width, you know, obviously that's going to dictate cost a little bit, but generally speaking, when you're, when you're buying one of the more expensive ones, rather than the ones that are closer to a thousand dollars, what are you, what are you getting for the, your money there? What, what are the kinds of things that you, you get for the more, with the more expensive well, ones? Let's talk about the ones that are a thousand, right? You know, Samsung and Samsung has a, a thousand, you know, they go on, first of all, here's a, here's a buyer's tip for everybody buying a holiday. Like Memorial Day is a great time to buy. Wait till July 4th. You know, then, you know, you guys have Labor Day and then Black Friday. And here's another tip about Black Friday. It's all November. So if you can do that, you can get something cheaper. Like Samsung has, you know, the thousand dollar one. But now you're talking about a wattage that's, you know, it's almost like, well, here's an induction range, but it's only the, the max burner is 2,400 watt, no bridge elements or anything like that. So really what you're looking at, the glass is the same. Shot Saran makes all the glass for everybody. So no glass is better than the other. Really what you're talking about is wattage in the configuration of the top. And then what type of technology is in the oven? That's really, if you break it down, and that's what makes Mila so good because you just hit a button and let the range figure it out itself, right? I don't think, you know, some of the features that you're, you're hearing about like air fry never really has fried anything in any particular range from any brand. Air sous vide is a two hour cycle and a 20 minute finish. Really what it comes down to is for, for um, is configuration of the top, what special features it has in the oven, you know, how large it is, you know, that Fisher Pickle 36 has got a great top, but the oven at 36 is only 4.9 cubic feet, right? You, have 30, you can get a 30 inch LG that's 6.3 cubic feet, right? And then you, you know, what kind of special stuff do you want a warming drawer or anything? It's all about mm -hmm. what you're gonna put wattage bridge um special features in the oven um warming draw non-warming drawer and then what is the reliability in all these things and can you get it fixed and, and that's the that that last two are the part that people just never seem to get right is can i google for two minutes to figure out can this thing be serviced and, and that's how you do it and then buy it on a holiday and you'll buy it less but if something's really super cheap you know the appliance business is notorious for what's called like nail down or step over models where, yeah, it's a thousand bucks. And oh, by the way, for another 500, you get like a, a burner that you can actually use. That's like real induction. So just be careful of that. So that's what it comes down to is you look at the top, you look at the special oven, uh, special oven configurations, you look at the bottom, and then you check the reliability stats and, and that's how you buy a range. That's really helpful. Thank yeah. you, Steve. Super helpful. Um, well, maybe that's a good way to wrap things up. What do you think, Joe? Yeah, I think that sounds great. Huge thanks to our panelists today. Steve, Richard, Rochelle, you guys are all stars, like we said, and have, thanks for sharing your knowledge. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank it's nice you meeting all. you guys. Um, um, really, I appreciate, appreciate uh, you having me. Yeah. Thanks very much. And to our audience, uh, thanks for tuning in today, and hopefully you got something good out of it, and uh, we just make sure you uh, let us know if you have any questions that didn't get answered. We'll try to answer those for you. And good luck with all your electrification projects and hope to see you next time. Yeah. Thanks, Thank everybody. You.